Amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41 says this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. Squall is like a tempest, is a storm. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. We all know that Mark's gospel was purposed to present the person, the work, and the teaching of Jesus through actions that speak louder than words. Mark Paul's, as we know in, in chapter uh, 4, as well as uh, starting, in, in, uh, well, starting in chapter 4, to recap some of the parables that Jesus was saying during this time. And so he takes a pause to speak on these things uh, in regards to parables that spoke about the conditions of the heart that hinder the word from growing in one's life. He then spoke about the parable of the growing seed, which reveals the likeness of the growing seed, which, I'm sorry, the likeness of the kingdom of God. Lastly, he spoke about the parable of the mustard seed, to which we, 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 taught, or we learned last week, that was also likened to the kingdom of God. And then he was talking about small beginnings in which we should not despise but its end reaches heights and proportions beyond our understanding that affect our world and the world around us. These parables were meant to get the hearer who can hear and seer who can see to seek after the Lord and the true meaning that was attached to the parables. That was the purpose of the parables in which uh, Mark took the time to pause and allow and explain the, the parables that Jesus was speaking during that time. He didn't just speak those amount of parables that, that Mark gave. He spoke other parables during that time. But Mark strategically pulled out, right, exegete, uh, as we called it, the parables that Jesus gave during that time to put in his gospel with, with precise precision and decision. It was to get the hearers like ourselves and others who would read this gospel to understand exactly what Jesus was trying to do. It was to reveal his person, his work, and his teachings so that individuals can go after Jesus Christ and seeking after a clear understanding of the question, why Jesus? Why the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? What are you talking about, about this word that you describe as a seed? All these things was to get the hearer and the seer, and the seer to seek after the Lord to gain understanding. And so we are living in a time, as we all know, that many people are not seeking after the Lord. And yet there's a, the word, there's a verse in the Bible that says, seek after the Lord while he may still be found. That verse ought to terrify us because it lets us know there's going to be a time where you seek after the Lord. And guess what? He is not going to be found. There's going to be a time where heaven will shut. The grace of God will shut down. It will be closed to anybody. And we're talking about the tribulation times. And it is a time that, okay, God, man, I, I get it. I see it. And you're going to try to cry out to him. And heaven is going to be closed. During that time, people are going to want to die, and they're not going to be able to. People are going to try to jump off cliffs and do different things, and they're not going to be able to die to remove themselves out of the craziness of this world. And so what begins to happen is that God is trying to get our attention now so we can seek his face now, so we can gain the understanding of his kingdom now to receive his word that is given like a seed to grow in our hearts right now. But guess what happens just like I had when I was a child? Oh, we got all the time. We got all the time we need. The enemy comes in and he deceives us. And he says, listen, you got time. You can do that when you're 40. You can do that when you're 50. 
You can do that when you're 21, right? Talking to the young people, right? You can do that. Just, you got plenty of time. Just do you right now. Go to church, you know, do your little check marks, you know, make sure that you're a religious person. Make sure that you at least look like a Christian. At least pick up the, the, the Christian dictionary, start learning some words so you can know how to talk like a Christian and, and just kind of raise your hand when you know how to raise your hand and, and, you know, say hallelujah when you know how to say, you know, during that time, that, okay, hallelujah, or amen during the sermon when everybody else says amen or stomp your feet or do your little, your little dance and your little jiggle and things like that. And people do those things and they'll seek after those kind of things, right? Those very, very surface things that kind of have them look like a Christian. Oh, but I'm telling you, that's not going to fly during these day and age. And so God is trying to call us out to seek after him and he's using parables. And so he explained everything to his disciples as they were alone, right? As we, at the ending of last week's sermon about the mustard seed. But I want to tell us something. It is one thing to hear and see what Jesus was talking about, but it's a whole other thing to experience it through actions. You see, we come to church, some of us, every single Saturday. Every single Saturday. Some of us attend, some of us, every single Wednesday. We hear the word. Right? We receive the word to a certain degree. We get excited. Woo! We get the goosebumps right, our hair stand up. It sounds so amazing. Some of it's challenging. Some of it is scary. Like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. And like some of us are on a roller coaster ride with Jesus. And we're just like, Jesus, what is this thing going to stop? And we're all over the place. And it was like, okay, man, I think I'm getting it. I think I'm getting it. But you don't have it until you experience it. You don't have it until those very things that you claim to learn, that you claim to profess, that you claim to declare, becomes the very, quote unquote, Jesus shoes on your feet. You begin to walk in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior by applying his word to our lives. It is one thing to say you're a Christian during parables, the reading and studying of the word of God, the casting out of demons and the healing of the sick. These are all exciting stuff. This is like, man, this is awesome. You know what I mean? Some of us come to, you know, to, to church, squad community church, like, man, that's what I'm talking about. No watered down word. Like, man, give it to us in the raw. And it's like, man, I got it. I'm getting it. Oh, but it is a whole other thing to apply these things to our own lives and experience the Lord in a real and tangible way. How many people know what I'm talking about? We can say we have the word in our hearts and even upon our lips, but when it truly counts, do we have the word in all actions to not just hold ever so idly? John 3.16. Oh, man, I can do all things through Christ. Who gives me strength? How many people use that for every single thing, including raising your kids, right? And so we have these scriptures in our hands, and Jesus wept, man, so he, you know, he cares about us, and you know, all these other things, right? All these other cute verses and, and verses that we take out of context and we apply it to ourselves, like, yes, man, God wants me to be blessed, hallelujah, I'm going to have businesses galore, I'm going to take over this whole community and, and just put all type of things going on, I'm owning everything. Yes, God wants me to have that jet, and God wants me to have those cars, and yes, man, that prosperity gospel, and it's like, man, we got this. We have those things in our hands, so to speak. But what happens when those things don't come the way you want it? What happens when your perspective of what you claim to be is not exactly lining up with your idea or your imagination? What happens then? And so we hold on to his word idly. But hold on to as an anchor holds to the bottom of the ocean or the lake and makes the boat immovable is where God would have us to be. Is Jesus the one who we fall back on in complete trust? I think about the trust fall, right? Everybody know what I'm talking about, the trust fall? And when things begin to happen, it's like, I don't know what's going on with me, let alone I don't have eyes behind my back, but they're saying that they're going to catch me, so I'm just going to let go. But many of us, what begins to happen, rather than falling back on, on complete trust in Jesus Christ, we fall forward in complete fear, in complete disgust, in complete discouragement, in anxiety and fear. And it's at that time where you, you have to ask yourselves, man, am I really in this thing? Because I know scriptures. 
I read the Bible every single day. I post at least one scripture on my social media a day, at least one. I post devotions. I, I post what we talked about last week. I share the message. I do X, Y, and Z. But man, when these things come, where is Jesus in me? Where is the word? What is going on? Is it real? Am I playing make-believe? Am I just imagining these things? Am I just seeing them in other people just because I want to see them? Are they lying? Are they really happy or are they just coming to church putting on a happy face and acting all crazy? Is this stuff real? Is the peace of the Lord real? Is the joy of the Lord real? Is what Jesus said in the word, is it real? And is it real for me? How many people know what I'm talking about or ask themselves that question even this week alone? As a president of the United States began to make his declarations and, and state of the unions, if you will, and, uh, and all his other dictatorship that he's doing uh, in which we voted him in. We can't do nothing about that. Um, it's what it is. But now we're reaping what we've sown. And, and now it's like we're asking ourselves, is, is this real? Is it really happening? And if it is, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in me? And so God is calling us to a place of abandonment. Is Jesus the one that we're supposed to be running to or, or going to? Or why is it that I seem like I'm running away from him as though I never knew him? And the testing of my faith comes in different manners of life's happenstances, happenstances and happenings. In this next section, as we just read, Mark continues in the actions of Jesus that reveals his person, work, and teachings in a very tangible way that we will all be able to feel before this sermon is done. He goes from parables and Jesus is speaking to right back onto business and talking about the actions of Jesus, speaking louder than the words. He wastes no time. He jumps right back in it and all of a sudden the crazy things start happening again and it's like, what is going on here? Who is this man? And whose man is this? And so he is the calmer of the storm. But how do we know who Jesus truly is? Ever see his work performed before us and able to trust his teachings and his word? If there is never a storm, we allow him to calm. I want to say that again because I know many of us are in a storm right now. And the question, listen to this. How do we know who Jesus truly is? If we never see his work performed before us and able to trust his teachings and his word, if there is never a storm, we allow him to calm. There is a storm brewing. and We all can feel it. And If you don't feel it, you better check your, your spiritual temperature. You better check your walk with Jesus because if you don't feel this, something's wrong with you. You are not in tune with the spirit of God. If you don't know what's going on right now in our world, you're lost. But we know and we feel it that there's a storm brewing. We can feel it. We can all see it on the news, on social media. We can see it in our neighborhoods. We can feel it in the core of our beings when we wake up and we take drives and we listen to the radio and we're like, what did he just say? What, what are we allowing this man to do? What are we allowing this society and this culture to do? What, where are we? Are we even in America anymore? Is this not the land of the free? And I know a lot of us complain about America and as, as, no, it's not a land of the free, man, this, that, and the other. But listen, you're going to know real fast that you once lived in the land of the free. You're going to know it real fast that we once had freedom. But there's coming a storm that is coming to take everyone's freedom away. And the church is asleep at this time and we're just allowing ourselves to be railroaded or some of us has put a blind eye and is like, yeah, he really didn't say that. Couldn't meant that. That's a, that's a conspiracy theory or is this, that, and the other. Even though you're watching the same video I'm watching and we're like, yes, he just said that. He just said that. We went from a time where it was, man, my body, my choice, and now it's not, it's, obviously it's not my body and it's definitely not my choice no more. How do we go from a time of freedom to a time of slavery? A slavery. How do we get to that, that moment? How do we get to that place in the land of the free? Can I tell you why? 
you fell asleep and got comfortable. Not in a Jesus dream, but in the American dream. And we're so busy now trying to pursue houses and white picket fence with four acres and a mule and maybe two horses and even an exotic rhino or something like that. It's just random, crazy stuff that we have on our bucket list. When we see the world around us that is dying, the murder rate is crazy, not just in Chicago, but it's everywhere. And we're living in the land of the free that's no longer free anymore. And it's like we're going backwards. There's a storm coming. It's not just any kind of storm. It is the perfect storm. Some of us already been in it. Some of us may be in the eye of it, right? Where it's not it's like a calm in the eye of the storm. You guys know what I'm talking about? And some of us may be coming out of a storm. And if we do not get out of the way of Jesus and his word, we will perish. Therefore, we must learn how to allow Jesus to be the calmer of the storm. There are three things the Lord wants us to learn about storms. Can we get into them this morning, men and women of God? The first thing that we have to understand in any kind of storm, that before the storm comes, there's a calm. Many people know what I'm talking about. There's a calm before the storm. That is number one that Jesus wants us to learn today. Look what the Word of God says in verse 35 and, uh, and verse 36. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, what did he say to his disciples? What did he say? Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, talking about Jesus, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. This is the calm before the storm that all of us experience, no matter where you're at in your walk with God, there's a calm before the storm. That you're ready to get in the boat with Jesus Christ. He had been preaching, you have been hearing him, the parables, and all these other things, right? And now all of a sudden, he gets up in the evening time, which the evening time would have been like the late afternoon in this culture and in this time where the sun is starting to go down. There's a little bit of sun, and they're looking upon the horizon of the Galilean Sea, and as they're looking on it, it's a very calmness. There's no storms brewing. The water's real calm. In fact, when you go to the other synoptic gospels, what you hear is that they were actually went off into a sail, meaning the wind was so beautiful, the water was so calm, that they didn't have to row themselves. They just simply let the wind take them to the other side of the Galilean lake, right? And so what was going on here? Jesus does his thing. He's very exhausted now, right? He's already inside the boat. They didn't grab any food. They don't have any preparations. There's no life jackets. There's none of that. He just simply said, hey, we jumped in the boat with Jesus, and we took him just as he was in the boat. And then on top of that, there were other boats that were going too, wishing that they can go in the boat of this man named Jesus. And while they're wishing that, we have to understand the context of what's going on, that in these other boats, there were people with hearts of different kinds. There was people with stony hearts. There was people with hearts that were wrapped up with the, with the world. There was people with hearts that they were so excited to follow Jesus, but eventually the moment persecution come, that's it, it's over with. And so there are all types of hearts following after the, uh, the boat in which Jesus is in, where the disciples are now in as well. And Jesus gives a word. And he gives a word and a command to the people. And he says, let us go to the other side. He then goes into the boat. And where the stern was at was like the, the starboard of the star was the starboard starboard of the boat, and there had to be some kind of cushion there where the individual, like the captain or something like that, can put his head down to go to sleep and get himself a nap as the, as they're just sailing away, you not have to do anything else. The wind is just gonna take him to the other side. At least that's what they projected, and theoretically, that's what they stood on, right? And so the first thing he does is he gives a word, a command. Let us go over to the other side. No type of preparation, no nothing. And they don't even realize that this is just a calm before the storm. Many of us in this, in this church and in our lives and in people under the sound of my voice, we are in the calm of the storm right now. We're hearing God's word. We're so excited for it. It's so awesome, man. Everything is cool, man. I have peace, man. I'm comfortable. You know what I mean? Everything is good. I'm getting inside the boat with Jesus, man. What can possibly go wrong? I'm in the, Jesus is in the boat, man. He is with me. 
What can go wrong? I'm good. I'm comfortable. Everything is just peaches and cream. I got new Bible. I'm like, oh, man, it's time to underline this thing. I'm going to underline everything, man, different color coordinations. I'm putting stars and stripes and all type of stuff in the Bible. Everything is just calm. Everything is going good. The marriage is going good. We just had counseling. They gave us an awesome word. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? Discipleship is going good. All these things are awesome. I got a good church, man. We're moving along, man. People are starting to get it. People are starting to grow. Everything is just a calm. It's like, this is amazing. Jesus is in the boat with us. This is awesome. There's a calm before the storm. But we have to understand that part of this calm before the storm does not negate that there's a storm coming. And some of us give a blind eye because we look upon the horizon with our eyes and we don't see any storm. But we just heard the word of God that gave us the command to go to the other side. And automatically we think that nothing possible can go wrong. But we don't realize it's not just any storm coming. It is a perfect storm. The one that will terrify us. The one that hits home. The one that really gets the best of us. We have to understand that we are always being prepared for a storm. And in a storm, or in a storm, or coming out of a storm, that seems to be the very journey of a Christian. You're being prepared for a storm, so it's the calm of the storm, or you are going into a storm, right? Or you are coming out of a storm. How many people know what I'm talking about? If you don't, just look at your life. Last week, man, it seemed to be good. Everything was decent. This week, what in the world happened? Yesterday, God was good and hallelujah. He gave me some revelation. And then today was the storm out this world and everything went wrong. And all of a sudden, I don't feel so happy. I don't feel so joyous as I did yesterday. What is going on here? It's because he's preparing you with something. And so we have to understand that we are here being prepared for a storm, going into a storm, or coming out of a storm. Therefore, storms have purpose. And if Jesus' word does not go before us, is not in us, and the boat that sustains and upholds us, this storm will catch us off guard and we will sink and be destroyed, never making it to the other side where Jesus desires to take us. The Bible says in Isaiah 55 verse 11 in the Amplified Bible, so will my word be which goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me Void, meaning useless, without result, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Jesus Christ, the very word made flesh, gave a command and a direction. Let us go to the other side. Based on this verse right here, whenever Jesus gives a word, that's exactly what that word is going to do. The thing is, it's going to also accomplish what it's sent out to do. Let us go over to the other side just gives us the vision of the very direction that God has taken us to. But part of that vision and part of that word is to test us to see where are we at with his word. It is to literally come before us and say, hey, in order to get to the other side, I have to prepare you for a storm. Because on the other side, as we know, and we'll talk about next week, on the other side, there were demons. In fact, there was a legion of demons. And there was deliverance on the other side. So there was a blessing on the other side. But in order to get to that blessing, you have to now be prepared for the perfect storm. And in order to get to the other side, you have to go through the storm. And some of us receive the word of God and we receive it so gutterly that he gives us the word that all we do is see that which is in front of us, but we don't see beyond what's in front of us and we assume all is good. And then when the storm hits, guess what we do? We forget the very word that God gave us in the beginning. God gave us promises inside this house. He gave us promises according to his word that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He gave us promises that he's our provider, that he is our God and our king. He is our Lord and our savior. He is our redeemer. He gave us promises according to his word. And the thing is, we have those words and we love those words. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. No weapon formed against me so prosper. My God made everything. He is the light that came into the darkness. The darkness did not recognize it. But praise God, he saved my life anyways. And now I'm born again and given the right to be called a child of God. Everything is good before the calm of the storm. I'm getting in the boat with Jesus. But what happens though? 
when the perfect storm comes upon us? Then what happens? That brings us to number two, the perfect storm. So there were, other, there were other boats with him. So they're looking, they're, they're looking. And you could imagine this, right? Other people are looking at us and they're like, man, should I even consider this, this dude named Jesus? Let me go on ahead and look at T-Dub's life. Let me. Yeah, she's in the, she says she's in the boat with Jesus. But who's that kid on the boat? That must be Dash. He, he's diving in and out the boat. And so they're watching. How's she going to handle Dash? How's she going to handle Dorian? How's she going to handle those girls? How's she going to handle loss? Loss of life. How's she going to handle marriage? And they're watching us. How's Valeria going to do it? How's Jesse going to do it? How's the Rosadas going to do it? How is the Ramos going to do it? They better do it right because, you know, that's their path. The past is the Ramos too, so they got to do it right. So I'll be right watching the Ramoses now. And everybody's watching. The other boats are watching. You know why they're watching? Because they want to see that person that's in the boat with you. They want to see that Jesus that's supposed to be in your heart. Where is that Jesus? And so you know how they watch us? is they begin to see, well, what's on their social media? Well, how do they handle, how do they talk? How do they do X, Y, and Z? And then even more, how do they handle storms? Because I'm in a storm, so I'm in the lake with them. They could be atheists. They could be agnostics. They could be Christians, half-breeds, whatever it is. They can be, you know, whatever they, they, whatever they are in these boats. And yet they're watching the person that claims to have Jesus in their boat. And the thing is, we're all living the same life in the same world called earth. And they're watching from their boat because you're claiming to have somebody special inside your boat. That name is Jesus who casts out demons, heals the sick, delivers, and all these other awesome things that they hear about. And was speaking with authority and all these other things, right? And you're standing on them. And so everything that's going on, we're just talking about, man, look at old Jerry over there. And curse no more. Sometimes pray for him. But something's going on with him. There's change there. Look at his mama, right? She coming all in, doing her thing. Don't complain. She got one hand, prosthetic knee. God has saved her life. Let me see how she acts because she claims to be a Christian. Does she complain about X, Y, and Z? How does she do it in her conditions? Okay, I see it. I see some change. I see what's going on. But you know what's going to ultimately show who's in your boat? The perfect storm. You know how, how God shows us who's in our boat? The perfect storm. Well, there's something about storms that will show us who we truly are. There's something about when we face terror, when we face fear, when we face these things that we have no control of at all, when we face the very elements that we cannot do anything with. It is during those times that God shows us who's really in our boats. And so they come to this point, jumping into the boat. Other boats are there. And then all of a sudden, verse 37 says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus, look at Jesus. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And then we'll, we'll move on from there. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, would you care if we drown? The audacity to have that ask Jesus a, a, a question like that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit because some of us in this house is blaming Jesus for what happened in our lives. And so we need to understand that this is now brewing the perfect storm. While the calm before the storm seemed all good, I got the word of God literally in my boat. I got some scriptures. He gave us a command to go to the other side. That means we're going to the other side. It is going down. They already knew about the scriptures in the Old Testament that God can control the weather, that God split the Red Sea, that God put fire coming down from heaven. They would sing songs about this stuff. Moses' songs and, and, and Miriam's songs and all these other songs, Noah's songs and all these other things from the Old Testament. But all of a sudden, you have God made flesh in your your boat and now you're facing the perfect storm and you forget the one who calms the storm. You forget the very worship songs that you sing every single Saturday. I was listening to that song that we have for corporate worship and I'm wondering, do we really believe this? Do we really trust in the Lord? Do we really wait on him? Do we know that he is faithful to his promises? How do we know if we actually know that we do these things? Oh, the perfect storm will reveal those things. 
And so they come, and he's sleeping down there, and they wake him up. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? We got to understand that the Galilee uh, Lake that was there, right, was surrounded by mountains. It was mountainous all around him. But what began to happen because of those mountains is that you had hot uh, air as well as cold air coming in, and it would sweep upon the lake. And because of the connection with those two different type of temperatures of wind, it would start to create waves that were huge, 10-foot waves and, and so forth, that it would create perfect storms. And these storms were furious. In fact, they were violent storms. But we have to understand also in the context is the individuals inside the boat were professional fishermen. They were not aware. I mean, they were fully aware of the very elements that happened upon this lake. They fished in this lake. They drew, they, 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 they had their boats on this lake. They knew all about this lake. They knew exactly the temperatures and different seasons. They knew all about this lake. But a perfect storm was upon them. And God wanted to deal with a different kind of storm that was going on within them. And that's why we call it the perfect storm. This was the perfect storm created just for the disciples and those in other boats watching ever so closely. You got to remember, those other boats were in the same storm that the disciples were in. The only difference was Jesus was in the disciples' boat and they didn't have Jesus in their boat. You guys following me? And so there's other boats that are watching ever so closely the boat that was with or that Jesus was in. It was a storm that brought with it violent winds that caused the water to rage with waves and which beat against the boat and filled it with water. The storm did not just affect the outside of the boats in which surrounded them all, but the elements due to the storm began to affect the inside of their boats that water began to fill the boat up. These were fishermen, as we talked about. They were professionals. They were professionals in severe weather. They were professionals when the weather was calm. They knew how to handle the elements. But in this storm, they could not handle nor control the elements which came against them ever so violently. So we have to understand, what is the perfect storm in our lives? Well, the perfect storm brings with it the lack of control. The lack of control. The lack of control. Somebody said the lack of control. I'm about to burn this whole thing down. Anyways, the lack of control. Mind you, they were professionals. They knew all about this stuff. But all of a sudden, they are now in a perfect storm where the elements are out of their control and their inability to handle the boat in such a way in this storm that the waves are beating against this boat and the water is now filling up the boat. We need to understand that all of us try to stay in, in, in uh, the beginning, the calm before the storm. And as we're in the storm, as long as we can handle it ourselves, as long as we can control the very elements of our surroundings and the very uh, issues or circumstances or situations to which we're in that, that really equate to storms, then we're okay. We don't call upon the Lord. We don't do none of that. We may even come to church and praise God, oh, hallelujah, yes, God has it, things like that. But all in reality, it's really you taking care of all the things. For, for a long time, many of us have gotten so comfortable with the calm of the storm, so comfortable with having control in our lives. But what happens when we end up getting a president as we have right now who begins to threaten the very control to which we once had? Then now all of a sudden, people have got to get mandatory and immediate vaccinations. And if you don't, we will fire you from the job. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, 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 wait a minute. I've been working this job 20 years. I, this whole job is my livelihood. And guess what begins to happen? The lack of control begins to expose the very storm that has already and has been inside of us from the beginning. It is the perfect storm because now it's showing us that we had areas in our lives that we controlled so much that God is saying, no, no, no. The only way to make it to the other side you have to lose control so that I can gain control so that I can get you to the other side. And when you don't, you will drown. And some of us around the world, not just in our church, but many churches and people in our world, they are drowning because they don't know how to lose control to Jesus 
because they've been so busy controlling everything, including Jesus. And so now we come into a state as we're in now. In America and everywhere else that they're doing this stuff. That now they're threatening the very livelihood that we have. And you know what begins to happen? We forget the word of God. We forget the fact that God was the one who gave us that job 20 years ago. We forget the fact that, listen, even though I was receiving a paycheck every week or every two weeks, I, wasn't, I was not supposed to be relying upon that paycheck. I still rely upon Jesus Christ because the moment that paycheck ends, guess what? I still walk forward in confidence with Jesus Christ no matter they're paying me or not. Because I know that once a door closes, God is faithful to open up another door and have another job that I'll be at for the next 20 years. Praise the living God. Can somebody give God some praise? There is a perfect storm upon us, and we need to know why this perfect storm is here. Just like COVID-19 and all the things that are going on in our society, these things are coming. The enemy is trying to use them to cause division. But what about if the enemy wasn't the one who started all this stuff? What about if it was God himself? Was Jesus ignorant when he made the statement, let us go over to the other side, as though he didn't know that there was going to be a perfect storm coming? If he was not ignorant of that, that means that on either two things, either the devil made that storm or God himself made that storm. Think about that. And I believe, yes, I believe that Jesus planned this storm. And I believe he planned it to such a degree because he needed to expose the very things in the disciples' heart so they can learn to let that stuff go and stop having control over your own life and give your life once and for all to Jesus Christ, who is the sovereign ruler of all things and creator of all things, including our human bodies made out of the very dirt to which we step on. And if he can make dirt and make us out of dirt, can he not open up the doors of heaven and pour blessings upon us that will provide for us until we see him face to face, financially, physically, materially, whatever it is. Some of y'all don't believe that, right? Some do, but some don't. But God is putting and creating a perfect storm because he wants to let us know, son, daughter, you need to stop having control and learn how to trust me, who is in all full control. Can somebody say amen? And so that is the first thing, the lack of control. Look what happened in 2 Corinthians 1.8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, meaning we couldn't control anything. It was out of our hands. We couldn't handle it. We couldn't control it. We couldn't manipulate it. Listen, we were in a position far beyond our ability to endure. We have been entered into a storm, and it is far beyond our ability to endure. What are we going to do now? When the rabbit has the gun now, what do we do now? When the government is coming in and trying to control your lives and trying to control your health and trying to control everything about you, what do we do now? Do we lose it? Or do we trust God? The lack of control. And it goes on. Okay. So that we despaired of life itself. You ever been in a storm that you thought it was never going to end and in fact the only thing that was going to end was your very life? You ever been in something that was so crucial? in your life, that you couldn't see beyond it and it felt like this thing was lasting for eternity and then when you look back, it was like, man, it's only been 30 minutes. But because of the fact that the immediately you lost control, was the, the, the simultaneously, you, you lost the control of your mind, you lost control of your thoughts, uh, your thoughts, you lost control of your emotions, you lost control of your words, that all of a sudden, instead of speaking the words of God, you begin to speak all type of stuff like, oh my goodness, baby, we're going to die. What are we going to do about rent? What are we going to do about the kids? We're going to have to sell one of these dudes on eBay. What are we going to do? What is going to happen in our lives? Dash is going to have to go to work right now to start making videos on Instagram or whatever, make people laugh or we can get some income. Something's got to happen. What's going to happen to our marriage? What's going to happen to our pretty car? I love that car. How are we going to make the, how are we gonna make the payments? My daughter's about to have homecoming. What kind of dress she's going to have? She's going to look like Cinderella. What's happening here? How are we going to do this? Right? We start so we suffer because we lose control. So then we lose control of our tongue. And we don't realize that death and life is in the power of the tongue. And then we start claiming things that are opposite of what Jesus Christ had already said. And we start saying things like, we're not going to make it. I had to rebuke my wife last night. I like putting my wife on blast, right? Before we go to sleep, out of all things, 
she wants to start saying, baby, you know, I'm just thinking about the fact that I'm about to read his age. I can't say the age. So I'm like, I was thinking about what, I was thinking about, man, the fact that I'm about to turn 21. And, man, you know, there's a lot of people that don't make it past 21. Check out the conversation. There's a lot of people that don't make it past 21. And I'm like, okay, maybe I'm not going to make it past 21. And I'm like, what? I'm getting a strong feeling. I, I, this is a true story. This just happened last night. This is not part of the sermon. I'm going to add it in there just so I put myself on black because y'all don't want to put yourselves on black. And I'm looking like, babe, stop talking like that, man. She's like, and then she gets up. And I'm, I'm so, it's like I can see all this happening right in front of me. I'm just like, and it looks like she's about to have a panic attack. And I'm just like, baby, just stop. No, but you're just, like, you don't have, there is a lot of people who don't make it. They're like, what about if this feeling is the fact that I'm not going to make it? So then she don't realize it. That starts affecting my brain. So I'm thinking like, God, are we dying tomorrow? <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is a true story. I'm not even playing. I'm like exaggerating nothing. I started thinking like, God, help me. Lord, if I die tomorrow, God, forgive me. Of all my sins. God. You know you start repenting if you think you're going to die. So I'm sitting in my pillow, and I'm talking to her and rebuke at the same time. But she don't realize it. it's starting to affect me. And I'm like, God, is that it? Is that... Am I going to see December 21st my birthday? And so I started thinking about all this stuff, and I'm like, God, we got to drive a long way to church tomorrow. Please protect us on the highway. I don't want to die like that. Like, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die persecuted for Christ. right? Like, not like that, God. Not like that. So I was trying to rebuke her, but this is a real life thing happening. Why? Because the moment the thought of losing control of her life stepped into her brain, it affected her emotions. Man, baby, I feel like, check out what I'm saying. This is a true story. Ask her after church. Baby, I feel like, you know, and then guess what happens? It affects her emotions. Guess what she starts speaking? Ooh, just vomiting, deaf, deaf. And then in my head, I'm like, can you just speak about yourself then? And just, <laughs> God is going to take you in glory, baby, but just leave me out of this thing right now. And so the whole thing is, I had to literally put a stop to it. Because just that fact, and it happens to all of us, y'all be lying if it don't happen to y'all, okay? Listen, the moment we lose control, we start spewing out death without realizing that the very words out of our mouths are not just killing ourselves, but they're killing everybody in our very atmosphere that's breathing the same air in the same room. Understand what I'm saying? They said, I can see the disciples running around like a, head, a chicken with a head cut off. Just, God don't care about us. This man, can you believe Jesus is in the stern sleeping right now? He's got a cushion. Yes. He's got a blue cushion. The one that has sway. Yeah, he's like, my cushion. He's laying on my cushion right now. He don't even care about us. It's like he's gone. Where is Jesus? Does he not know, realize that we have a dictator in office right now? Does he not realize what's happening in our government? Does he not realize what's happening in Chicago and the murder rates? Does he not realize what's going on? And they're talking and they're spewing death to each other. And guess what's happening? Fear is starting to take over them. Professional fishermen on the water in a secure boat. They're terrified now. And so what begins to happen is that it was a lack of control. They thought they were going to die, just like the disciples here. And he said, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despise of life itself. In verse 9, indeed, we felt, look at the feeling, we felt we had received the sentence of death. They started having their emotions to do that. Just like all of us do. We lose control. We start crying. We start thinking about our kids. We start, we start wondering, what's going to happen to my spouse? What's going to happen to my family? Am I going to make it? And some of you, because you know, y'all just like that, you didn't take my clutch and shoes. Like just my fears. Like, I'm over here next to you, bro. What's going on here, man? Well, some of us think about that stuff, right? right? They had that feeling, and they thought they were, had the sentence of death. Why is that? Because we start talking and we literally start, excuse me, excuse me, start putting ourselves in the sentence of death that we're walking around now on death row in the hallways of our homes. As we're going down the stairs to our kitchen, it's like, I'm not going to make it tomorrow, so I might as well just want to eat all those three donuts that I have inside this cabinet right now and just whatever, I'm have a heart attack, at least I'll die from that. And it's like we start having the sentence of death upon us. And we forget that the Lord is inside our boat. The Lord. Is inside our boat. 
So the storm did not just affect the outside, as we talked about it, it affect the inside. It started to mess with them on the inside. And there's something about a storm that it happens on the outside. We tend to try to have control over it. But what happens when it starts affecting us on the inside? What happens then? The next thing is this. Fear and anxiety start setting in. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The perfect storm come upon you. Now it's the, the area like we talked about with work and other things, and we're wondering, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my livelihood? How am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to take care of my kids? What's going on? Fear and anxiety start to set in and dig itself inside of our hearts that we start to panic and we start to be afraid, but we don't realize that once fear and anxiety are activated inside our minds and inside our heart, you know what starts getting deactivated? Faith. And the moment faith starts getting deactivated, you know what you stop claiming and stop standing on? The word of God. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing about the word of God. Fear and anxiety start setting in, and instead of standing and quoting and claiming the very word of God, we start claiming and quoting everything outside and opposite of God and faith through fear and anxiety. And so listen. This storm was made, let me give you the verse, Isaiah 40, verse 10. Do not fear. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Is God lying when he said this? This is his word. This is a promise he has made to his people, including us. And he tells us first thing, do not fear. But see, fear begins to hit us when the perfect storm comes upon us. It hits us in a way of fear and anxiety. And so when fear and anxiety comes, the opposite of the scripture then is this. We start to think, God is not with me. We start to be dismayed. We start to recognize as God, my God. Maybe he doesn't like me no more because I sinned last week. Maybe he doesn't like me no more because I haven't prayed enough this week. Maybe he left me. Maybe he's not with me no more. We start having fear and anxiety. Maybe he's not going to strengthen me now. Maybe I'm in this storm all alone. Maybe he's not going to help me. Maybe he's not going to uphold me with his righteous right hand. Maybe he left me and forsook me. And not just left and forsook me, but left and forsook my children, my marriage, my wife, my husband. And fear. And anxiety starts tearing us up. And we forget the initial word of God that says, let us go to the other side. We forget the promises of God. Why? Because in the calm of the storm to which all of us go through, we only took the word of God lightly. We thought it was so good. It felt so good. It sounds so sweet. But when it was time to apply it, fear and anxiety was what we applied instead. And so this, this was a storm that made them afraid and produced a fear that produced their faith, which made it the perfect storm. They forgot the words spoken by Jesus in the beginning of their voyage because they succumbed to the fear and anxiety they allowed to come into their boat. You remember the water was coming into their boat? It was not until the water started to come into the boat, the storm started to come into the boat, that they started to fear and have anxiety. And see, why is that? Because as long as the water wasn't coming inside the boat, guess what? I can handle and control the storm. But God made it so that the water and the storm can come inside the boat. Why? Because he was trying to show us your control is going to kill you. And if you don't start learning how to allow me to be in control of your life, then you will drown with the very boat that you think is going to sustain you. We have to let God be the God over everything. In the same way, you are going into a storm, and in the middle of the storm, you're coming out of a storm, and the question is, what has this storm done to you? That's you. Where will you be in your faith when the perfect storm comes upon you? How will you go to the perfect storm? We are in a storm right now, and the question is, where will you end up? Where will your faith be? 
Where would Jesus be? Where would you be? You see, is at this time, when you go back into the scriptures, what we see is that we think that Jesus left us, and so we blame him. God, it's your fault my child died. It's your fault these are happening to me. It's your fault my marriage ended. It's your fault that she didn't come through right now. It's your fault I'm living like this in this in circumstances and situations. God, it is your fault. And now I come to tell you, it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. And that if anything, God is available. And he is trying to get us to draw near to him so that he can draw near to us because there's a worse storm on the way. And it is a storm that will send many people to hell because they will walk away from Jesus. And even now, people are walking away from him, even right now. Our current situation is a perfect storm we are all in. That is causing everybody around the world to fear about this COVID-19. It's causing everybody to fear about the mandation of the vaccination. It's causing everybody to wonder what else is coming down the pipeline. And we are living now in constant fear and anxiety. Why? Because we have turned our backs upon the word of God. We turned our backs on Jesus thinking that I got to do it myself because Jesus is sleeping in heaven and he ain't doing a good job. And so that leads us to the third uh, thing under the, the, the second one, the perfect storm. And it ends in this, a mindset of being forsook and drowned. Look at how they come at Jesus. Jesus was in a stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? That question was a smack in Jesus' face. It was to blame Jesus for what they're going through and to blame him that he was an inadequate, an inadequate father, an inadequate parent, an inadequate God, an absentee Lord and Savior, an absentee Father. It is to blame him and say, you don't even care what's going on in my life. How many people have ever been there? Well, you sit there and you're in your car and you're so filled with anxiety and the lack of control and, and fear and all these other things. And your mindset is now thinking and speaking to you and is saying, God has forsaken you and you are now drowning. And you're in your car. You can barely see past the light and you're trying not to crash because you're crying so much. And you're crying out to the Lord, you don't even care about me, Jesus. You don't even care if I drown. You don't even care that my heart is broken, God. You don't even care that my mind is, is, is just chaotic right now. You don't even care, Jesus. And the whole time, you think he has forsaken us. You think he's sleeping on the job. You think he doesn't know what's going on with your life. But the whole time, you know why Jesus is sleeping in this boat? Because he knows his word. And he says, no matter what happens, my word has already been out. And it's going to accomplish what it's set out to do. It's not going to come back void. So I can go to sleep because I know we're going to get to the other side. We're going to make it to the other side. And so he's sleeping, but they come at him with this question. You don't even care that we're about to drown. So look at the word says. Isaiah 26, verse 3, the Amplifier says, you will keep. Who are they talking about? God. God will keep. Listen, I need everybody to pay attention here, especially if you have issues in your mind. Listen to this. You will keep in what kind of what? In what? Perfect and what? Constant peace. The one whose mind is steadfast. That is committed. Somebody say committed. And focused on you in both inclination and character because he trusts and takes refuge in you with hope and confident expectation. That's a beautiful verse. That's a beautiful verse to memorize. But we have to understand, listen, we may ask ourselves, how do we get that peace? How do I get peace? And all this craziness is going on. What is going on here? Listen, you get it because you have kept yourself focused and committed on Jesus. Your mind has been staying on Jesus constantly. That is why when the perfect storm comes, it affects our mindsets. 
and it begins to change the very perspective about God. And it begins to say, listen, God has forsaken me and now I'm about to drown. But it is opposite of this verse. Because if our minds are set on God, we're not only trusting God, we're not only looking to God, but listen, we are hoping and confidently expecting God to come through. What does that mean, Steve? How do I overcome this? What do I have to do? You have to get out of the way. You have to get out of the way. Remove yourself out of the way and let Jesus be the way of your life. What do you say? How does that look like, Steve? What am I supposed to do with that stuff? Listen, when storms come upon you, if our mind is on Jesus, we simply step aside and say, oh, God, this is on you. Let me move to the side. We're not supposed to start fearing, taking our mind off Jesus. No, it is at that time we say, well, thank God I serve a faithful God. Oh, I'm fired because of this. I'm not taking the vaccine. Cool, thank you. God bless you real good. I'm going to leave out of here, and I'm leaving praising and worshiping God. Why? Because this just allows my God to come through mightily so that everybody can see. Skip your vaccination and praise God that he is able to deliver and provide for me in spite of your stupid vaccination. You guys understand what I'm saying? Some of us got to get so confident in God again. Come back to our source of worshiping God and aligning our thoughts and our mind and our heart on Jesus Christ and, and look at things the way God looks at it. Why wasn't Jesus worried about none of this stuff? Because he stood on his word. He was the word made flesh and he knew my word is faithful. The, the problem is this. We're in the way. We're in the way. Our fear's in the way. The death that we speak is in the way. All these other things are in the way. Your false thoughts and perspectives are in the way. Your emotions are in the way. God didn't say, listen, walk by faith and a little bit of emotion and I'm going to bless you. No, walk by faith and not by sight. That means, listen, I got to take my emotions out of this stuff. Oh, you're going to fire me in my job? I got kids and all this stuff. I'm trying to put food on the table. Then that means that, hey, God, that means that you already prepared a way. So, hey, do your thing, God. Do your thing, God. You see, from the outside looking in, you think I'm a crazy man. People think you have lost your ever-loving mind. That's not real. Let's get real. Let's talk about the real stuff. Steve, you're nuts. No, I'm not nuts. I experience God for myself. I'm not staying in the calm of the storm. When the storm comes, I'm diving in. Why is that? Because I know this is just an opportunity for my God to shine. It is just an opportunity for my God to break up all these storms and be the calm storm, the calmer of the storm in every storm. It is an opportunity for the world to see Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to start understanding now. Yes, we're in a society that is a dictatorship. Yes, we're in a society where our president knows best, better than our bodies, than we know our own bodies. At least he claims, right? Yes, we're in a time where we're being threatened of our own livelihood. But as Jesus fell and chipped over and off of his throne, is he no longer reigning? Did he stop providing? Does his word. No longer void or no longer valid? Is it, is it void now? Does this, should we just burn the Bible now because it means nothing now? Because we're in a storm that we have no control of? No. It is a time where we bust this Bible open and we go into prayer and we say, Oh God, I pray that you will stand up right now and tell this storm to be quiet and still. Oh, God, I thank you that no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that comes against me shall be condemned. Why? Because you said that this is my inheritance. Oh, God, I thank you that you have given me a future. And even though that future may not be a future on this world, oh, I thank you that I have eternal life right now. And that even if they kill me for my faith, oh, God, I thank you that immediately I will be in your presence, praising your holy name. See, some of us only think about this old fleshly world. And we're so caught up in this world that we can't think beyond it. We make God a finite God with us. And then we, make him, we try to make him our friend in our misery. Think about that. It's so oxymoronish. That's even a word. I'd be making up words up here, so pray for me. But if that's a word, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And so what happens next, right? I want to try to wrap this up. But take heart. There is encouragement, my friend. Some of us I want to read some of this stuff I have right here. God equips us and prepares us in the perfect storms to get us out of our comfort zones and become doers of the word and not just hearers. Why? 
Because if there is no storm, there is no experience and opportunity to see the person, the work, and to apply the very teachings of Jesus. Why is this important? Listen to this. Because there are other boats in this world going through the same storm, looking and observing the boat that has Jesus inside of it and waiting to see how to steer their boat like Jesus. And some of us, listen to this, some of us are failing. Why we're failing? Because rather than keeping our minds committed and focused on Jesus and complete trust, hope, and confident expectation of Jesus' word, which would have never come back void, we act like he forsook and allowed us to drown. Instead of getting ourselves out of the way of Jesus and his word, we blame and accuse Jesus of not caring if we drown as though he is sleeping on his part. We're failing in this area. And God continues to create the perfect storm for us. And we fail again. And we're not getting it. And so we wonder, man, what is going on in this storm today, God? What is happening in my storm today? Can I encourage you today? It's not up there, but if you guys can open up your Bibles, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 on down says this. We do not want you to be uninformed. Remember that verse? Brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia, we were under great pressure for far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despise of life itself. Verse 9. Indeed, we felt we had received the senses of death. But look at what happens. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves. Why do storms come, Pastor? What is this storm I'm in right now? They come so that we do not rely upon ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that we, can, that we will continue to be delivered. As you help us by your prayers, then many, look at what happens, right? The other boats. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Why are we going through this, Pastor? So that you can stop relying upon yourselves and start relying upon the God who raises the dead. Why does it say raise the dead? Because if God can raise the dead, can he not provide for us a job? If God can raise the dead, can he not deliver you from circumstances and situations? If God can, can, not, can raise the dead, can he not do all things? It's the God we serve. And I want to encourage you, if we can give it up for Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. We need to be encouraged by this. And so in closing, well, you guys will have it up here, but the last thing is the calmer of the storm. Jesus gets up. He rebukes the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He got up, and he rebuked these things. He rebuked the elements that was outside of the control of any human being. But yet the God-man in human form stood up and he controlled the very elements of, of, of the weather and nature to which nobody has the power to do but God himself. And he shows himself to be God. He looks at his disciples and says to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You see, they would have never known Jesus as the calmer of the storm if there was never no storm to calm. We would never get to know the Jesus of the Bible if there's never opportunity to allow Jesus to be the very person that we read in the Bible in our lives. If we never step aside and say, Jesus, I read this in your word. You did it, and I know you can do it again. Have your way. Instead of just standing there like, no, Jesus, stand back. Jesus, I got this. I got this. I'm just going to take a loan out for $70,000, God, with a 50% with a interest rate or some random crazy stuff. I got this, God. I got to control. I don't need you right now, God. Maybe later for my spouse, but right now I got this. And we begin to make the stupidest decisions in our lives. Why? Because we don't just simply let God be the calmer of the storm. And 
some of us don't know God the way as other people do because we are never allow him to. Some of us here have broken hearts, fear, and all these other things. How would you know that God is an overcomer and will help you overcome if you don't ever allow him the opportunity to help you overcome? How do you know that God is greater than your fear if you don't allow him to deal with your fear? How do you know that, if, that God is a true deliverer if you don't allow him to deliver you? How do you know if God, if God is a provider if you don't allow him in those times to let him provide for you? I have so many testimonies that I can speak about about God's provision. We had our lights turned off, and God literally told me, don't you get alone out there and turn on those lights. Basically, I have a plan. And these lights were off for some time, right? And so we're in there. I'm like, well, God, what do you want us to do? This is what he tells me. It may sound like crazy for you guys. I want you guys to get closer. Seriously. With no lights. Yeah. Because apparently when the lights go on, nobody wants to talk. Apparently when the lights are on, I'm playing video games. Lala's watching Harry Potter. Mom's doing whatever she's doing. The other kids are doing whatever they're doing with electricity. I got to turn off the lights so that you guys can remember that I am the lights of the world. And it was in those times, my daughter's right there. It is in those times that we had such amazing and adventurous times. It was humbling times too. Because there was times I was in school. I had to go do homework and I had to go to Starbucks uh, with everybody else. And they had to do their homework online. And we were in Starbucks for hours. And I'm writing whole papers at Starbucks. But we were giving God glory and praise. And it was some of the most amazing times. You may think, well, how did God provide? Your lights were still off. Oh, no, there was lights on. It was just lights that go beyond this world. There was other times we couldn't pay our rent. We're asking both of us. I lost my job and she lost her job. About two weeks afterwards, we're like, how are we going to pay rent? All of a sudden, a man comes. He gives me an envelope. Right? I was driving the vans. That's how I met uh, Derry. I was driving the vans for the church, picking up people or whatever, rebuking them on the way. And Derry was one of them. And so this man jumps in the van and he gives me an envelope. And I was like, he's like, hey, man, God told me to give you this. Bam, he gives me this envelope. So I'm like, what the heck? So I was like, okay. So I'm trying to cry. So I was like, okay. I put it in my stuff. I'm like, I'm going to read it. I'm going to wait until my wife. And so when I get back, I'm all excited. I tell my wife, well, trust me, babe. This is early in the morning. I'm like, babe, listen, man. You know, this guy gave me this, this, this envelope. He said, God told him to give it. So we'll open it up. So I open it up. And, and, and I'm literally, I'm not counting it. And there's like hundreds. And I'm just like, one and two and three. And I was about to stop. No, it keeps going. Four and five and six and seven and ten. And I'm looking at her. She's trying to cry. It's eight and nine. And it's a, it's a thousand bucks, babe. What do you mean? That's the amount of our rent. I know. Because we serve a God who provides. That even though we don't know where the, where the thing's going to come from. But God is able because he owns everything. And he's in charge of everyone. That he says, listen, I want you to give the Ramoses a thousand dollars. You don't got to know why. Just go do it. Yes, sir. Goes to his bank that morning, early in the morning before church. Pulls out a thousand bucks, puts it in an envelope, and all he said was, "God told me to give you this." I took it, put it in my pocket, went off, met my wife. It was a thousand dollars to pay our rent. Don't tell me that God is not a provider because He's a provider. Don't tell me that God can't put food on the table because during that time we never went hungry. We may not be eating flaming young and, and lobsters and, and, and shrimp, but we were eating every single day, every day, because our God provides for our needs. He is the calmer of the storm. But he can't calm storms and be known as that in your life and worship like that in your life if you never give him the opportunity to do so. So today I want to end with Psalm 23. Can we all stand? I'll read it out of this Bible. You guys ever, taught, ever wonder, where does Psalm 23 ever come from? How did he write that beautiful, beautiful psalm? You guys know what I'm talking about, Psalm 23? You guys know, no, you're going to know it tonight or today. I want us all to meditate upon these words. Daniel is going through trials and tribulations, some of the worst of his time. And yet he pens in Psalm 23 in the midst and the surrounding of his enemies. And this is what he says because he knew the calmer of the storm. He says this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He was living in a cave and underground in holes. And he had the audacity to say, my Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, meaning I can go to sleep knowing that 
my God is in control. He said, he leaves me beside quiet waters. I'm sorry, yeah, quiet waters. Does that mean that the waves weren't bashing like the storm? Yes, they were. But in the mind of David, because his mind was focused on God, the waters were calm for him. Oh, they can be roaring and a tempest can come. But for him, man, look, it's still waters for me because I trust my God. I see beyond what I see in the natural. I see it in the spiritual. Some of us need to start doing this. He guides me. I'm sorry. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Look at what he says. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. A rod is what you use to discipline. A staff is what you use to guide people. That means by his discipline and by his guidance, I'm able to go down the right path. He says, you prepare a table before, in the, before me in the presence of my enemies. When people come against you and say vile and things and all type of things against you, listen, you can, be, you can be sitting there prepared with a table by Jesus Christ, eating good, at peace, like, I don't care what you're talking about, homie. I got a good God and my God is good. You can talk what you want, but no, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that comes against me, it shall be condemned. I'm going to keep eating my chicken. I'm not worried about what you're talking about. Because my God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. That's a sign to have joy in my mind. I have a still mind. He says, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He went beyond his world to the very destination that was on the other side of death. And he said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And what he did, he went to sleep. Why? Because he knew he was going to make it to the other side. Some of us, we need to be still and know that God is God and know that if God has said it, he's also going to perform it and make it right. And he's going to get us to the other side, no matter how it looks like. So I want to encourage us today. Talk to your storm and tell your storm, I will no longer allow you to create a storm within me. But instead, I will focus on the Jesus that I serve, who is the calmer of all storms, especially the storm that wages inside of me. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for who you are and what you are. God, I pray that we will be like John who just steps aside and said, I must decrease so that Jesus may increase. God, I ask that you would have your way, God, that your name be glorified. And God, we step aside and say, Lord, be the calmer of all my storms that rage within my mind, that violently come against my heart, God, and help me to stand and declare your word. God, I pray that you would heal our hearts that have been broken. That you would forgive us for waking you up in a sense and saying, God, do you even care that we drown? God, forgive us for blaming you for the things that we have been through in our lives. And Lord, help us to now instead draw closer to you so that you can be the calmer of all storms in and through our lives so that the other boats that are sailing and rowing beside you can see that man, that one, has Jesus in their boat. God, may you have your way. We thank you. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ? Hallelujah.